Oh, I should say that if you've missed the class and you don't want to take the quiz for that chapter until I've posted the video lecture, that is okay. Uh, check in with me about that. But if you need that little bit of time and you want to see the lecture, although the videos are not perfect or anything, uh, that's we can we can manage that. All right. So networks, networks um, are a big part of geography um, because they show the relative relation between places, right, and things that connect those places. Networks of all kinds of all kinds of different things. Um, but these networks, although when we look at them at, uh, on a map, they seem very static, right? They seem set in place, but they're flows, they're flows. Uh, you can think of traffic, right? Uh, these networks, um, if some flow is interrupted, uh, that can change the network and maybe they'll have to be alternative networks that come into, come into use. So for example, well, during the, the whole pandemic, does anyone remember any shortages of anything? You'd go to the store and buy and they'd be like, oh, we don't have that. It would be something you normally have. I think toilet paper was the big one at first, right? Um, well, those things are still happening, right? Every now and then, if you're going shopping, it's like, oh, I used to always get this, this one thing and, and they don't have anymore. Like, if you want to go buy a new bike, right? It's like, well, everybody was buying bikes. Uh, everyone was biking around. Uh, so a lot of places ran out of bikes. And, well, the things that we buy are usually part of an international commodity chain. So if any one part of making bikes um, runs out, like let's say it's just there's a rubber shortage, right? Well, although the bike has plenty of other stuff, you need rubber. Uh, and so if you have a shortage of that, you have a shortage of bikes. <clears throat> um, networks and their flows can also show kind of hierarchies of power, right? Um, we talk a lot about power relationships in this class and networks are kind of the vital part of that. And we're looking at networks in places that um, are less connected. Uh, we talk about accessibility. Some specific examples we'll be talking about landlocked countries, the digital divide, time space compression. <clears throat> so, an example from the textbook of a network, right? Um, now, in Argentina, the original rail line network was set up during colonial times, right? So, the network wasn't made, well, you see a very strong actual uh, hierarchy of certain cities here, right? Places where you would ship off resources. So during the colonial era, the railroads were put in, not so people can like mix in between places, but so that goods, well, raw materials, not even goods, raw materials that could then be made into goods would be shipped out, right? So you have all, this huge flow of resources for hundreds of years flowing out of places uh, and flowing into, well in this example during colonial times, this would have been a colony of Spain, so flowing into Spain, right? A lot of raw goods. Now through time, of course, Argentina, like many places, got its independence and started to try to change these networks to more suit people who lived in the country rather than just suiting people in a whole other country on their side of the ocean, right? Uh, but this is a slow process. And then on top of this process, we have the more, well, the main way of transportation since railways, which is roads, a road network would be very different because it is actually connecting people rather than just shipping out goods. <clears throat> um, there's a little part in the textbook talks about hub and spoke system for airlines. It says that it didn't draw it because you could probably, well I was just talking about a bike, you could probably picture a hub and spoke. I feel like the writing things in here don't work very well. Oh, that's not too bad. Right? Hub and spoke. Right? So you have the area in the center uh, like an airport. Right? Now, when we talk about hierarchy in places that have relative more power or less power, um, you know, if you lived in North Dakota and you wanted to fly to South Dakota, it might actually be cheaper for you to fly through the Twin Cities and then back 
right? Because we get more flights through. We have larger, um, well, we have a larger population. We have a much larger um, business. Uh, our, our industry is larger, right? All these things are larger. So when it talks about relative kind of power and accessibility, uh, Twin Cities is a bit more accessible than say the Dakotas, right? <clears throat> Hub and spoke system. Um, there's all kinds of examples of, you know, staying on the transportation topic, um, of transportation networks uh, being used uh, by po the powerful, right? Um, so one example in uh, apartheid South Africa, the road networks were basically connecting the wealthy uh, white cities. And as you can see, they would go around what would be what was called in uh, South Africa, the different homelands that you had the actual original African populations. And these are the populations who actually worked most of the jobs. Uh, but as you can see, it would be difficult for them to actually commute to the places of employment because the roads were often sent around these areas, right? So it wasn't serving local people, just kind of the powerful local people. Um, staying on the topic of transportation, example, uh, in the Twin Cities, or actually in the United States, of how transportation networks have changed through time as power has changed. So for a long time, when, when the cars were first being assembled and became popular and everyone started having cars, um, you had central business districts, and that's a term from this chapter, central business district. Uh, well, basically all the roads would go a bit like a hub and spoke system where you'd have your central business district and areas that were outlying like suburbs and whatnot, um, you would basically have to go through the center of the main city if you wanted to travel. Even if you wanted to travel to a place that was relatively near where you were, well, the roads went here, so you'd have to go like that. Now, it wasn't until um, we switched to suburbanization that we then actually put in, well, roads that looked a bit more like this, that were connecting the suburbs, because the suburbs grew in relative power and prosperity. Wealthier people were moving to the suburbs, everyone was having cars. So that's when you had, say, uh, 694, 494, 394. These are all bypassing the central city. So what happened as far as power relations through time in the US, well, the suburbs started gaining more power and the central city started becoming not the place people were shopping anymore, right? Central cities, inner cities, their economy started going down because people were going out to the big malls, right? And just directly from other suburbs, completely bypassing downtowns. It wasn't until the 90s that downtown started coming back again uh, well, we'll talk all about that when we get to the chapter on North America. <clears throat> Global accessibility, right? Um, this is a mixture of looking at countries that are landlocked, countries that uh, are part of a digital divide where they don't have great internet service. Um, as you can see, kind of patterns that you might assume around the world. Um, landlocked countries, uh, it's kind of interesting because, well, you know, when we talk about uh, empires or uh, colonialism, you can see that often many of the great powers were on coasts, right, and had big sailing ships and fleets. Um, but not always because, well, you could see one country there, Mongolia, which is above China, um, which is, it's landlocked, it's cut off, but the country itself used to have larger borders that were closer to the sea. But of course, the Mongolian Empire was never really a seafaring one, right? The main uh, transportation technology at the time was horses. Um, and somewhat uh, interestingly, Mongolia, you know, is a much, uh, not anything near an empire of what it was, right? I think the population of the country itself is only like a couple million. Um, do not have a great industry. Uh, it's one of those things when we're looking at uh, kind of connected to gun strips and steel, when we're looking at climates in different areas and what that does for their relative prosperity, uh, before the Mongolian Empire took off, they actually had more than a generation of different weather, of really great rains and relative prosperity. 
Um, and then it's actually when the climate started kind of changing back to a bit more drier uh, that the population started seeking out resources from neighboring countries. Um, digital divide, this might be a, a, a term you found in other classes, but maybe not. Has anyone ever heard of the digital divide as a topic in a previous class? Just a couple more. Well, it's what it kind of sounds like. Um, a lot of places just don't have reliable internet access, right? Um, and it's hard to, these days, take part of the global economy without that. And it's not just a matter of, you know, your, your internet access alone. Um, you know, there are places that don't have power. Obviously, you need power. Um, since the switch to doing everything through a phone, that has actually really increased accessibility for lots of places. Uh, this map doesn't say when it was made, uh, but I would imagine it would be interesting to see a map uh, that was more recent, that took into account a lot more uh, cell phone use. But other things are part of the digital divide that like, you probably don't even necessarily think of, which is, like, let's say you're online, you've got to fill out a form somewhere, you may notice that the number of languages that form allows might be just 10 languages. It's like, well, what if that's not one of your languages? You gotta learn another one. It's like, okay, right? Things like that make the internet less accessible to lots of people. Hmm. Let's see. So there's, you know, we talk in this class a lot about things like global processes, but also how local places um, kind of set their own rules, but also how global processes can affect local rules. So one of the main ones it talks about in this chapter is, um, well, like suburban sprawl, right? It's like cheap oil. I don't know if people have traveled to a lot of different countries, but our oil here is relatively cheap. Um, and we produce a lot of oil, but we actually, we import a lot of oil too. Um, but this cheap oil, uh, well, what it's done is our, our cities are quite a bit more sprawling than most other places in the world. Most other places have more of central city, more dense urban growth. Here, well, not only suburbanization, but a huge infrastructure for cars, right? Great big, strong highways. Um, they look at uh, Mesa, Arizona as part of an example of suburban sprawl. Um, and actually, the whole what, what's called the Sun Belt, um, warmer places in the US, have been the ones that are rapidly increasing and also uh, suburbanizing because, well, um, these are all cities and growth that came about well after automobiles became the norm of transportation. Uh, lots of older cities in the US, they're more compact because they're, well, based on previous models of transportation, uh, usually being rail lines, trains, um, and of course the further back you go, gets into different things. Uh, used to be a lot of canals, actually. It's kind of tough to visualize. If you travel to other countries, they'll still have their old canals in that are for transportation or moving goods. Uh, but we filled ours in and then paved them over. So if you're ever, for example, if you're in uh, California, New York, and you're on a street that's called Canal Street, that was usually just literally a canal that used to have water that they just filled up and put a road over it, right? It's already land that's cleared, so it's easy enough to put a road on. Um, there's also a bit in this chapter about the rise and fall of the price of oil through time. Um, and well, how much more uh, use of cars and trucks there are through time. They use the term peak oil, which is kind of interesting. That's one of those terms that used to be a lot more in vogue. Um, people heard the term peak oil before? Maybe in an environmental class? Huh? Well, it's one, of those, it's one of those terms that I think I've been hearing about for probably over 30 years. Uh, and although, you know, price of oil does go up, I haven't really seen, seen uh, people using less of it, right? The term peak oil kind of assumes that there will be a point where there, we won't have so much oil and we'll have to switch to alternatives, uh, but they keep on kind of digging up more. <clears throat> uh, 
Site and CWIP situation, these are a couple terms we've already talked about, but we're going to use them in some specific examples. Um, site and situation, so site basic attributes of a specific location. So examples, many cities are sited on the fall line of a river. That's dr taken directly from our text. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff in the text kind of assume you know different terms. Do people know what a fall line of a river is? Because most cities are on the fall line of a river, right? But then if the book doesn't tell us what a fall line of a river is, it's like, well, who knows what that is? Um, people know why the Twin Cities, why the Twin Cities exist where, where they are, why are they a relative economic powerhouse? Yeah. Yeah. The shipping industry with the river. Yeah. Because we are on the fault line. Uh, St. Anthony Falls, right? A fault line is, is simply, well, that's what I just wrote with out here. Uh, let me think if there's an easy way to make this on a map of some sort. Let's just say we're looking at the coast, the, the east coast, right? And you have a number of rivers coming in. Well, rivers erode, right? Rivers erode. A river has kinetic energy. And as it moves, it picks up stuff. If you ever look at a river and see how it's like full of sediment and stuff, or just walked in a river or swam in a river, and you're like, oh, that's full of muck and stuff. Well, rivers carry stuff down. So St. Anthony Falls is where we have, uh, a, a, that's literally where our fall line is because you have the river coming over and it goes down the fall. Well, that fall actually is eroding and it's moving backward through time. Uh, and, and so it actually stopped because we put in a whole bunch of concrete a whole bunch of stuff to make it fixed because we didn't really want to kind of move our, our cities, right? A couple of feet a year just to keep up with the, with the rivers moving. Well, that fall line, all kinds of cities, if they're not right on the coast, they're usually on those fall lines because that's energy, right? It's falling. That's where our big milling industry started out here, right? Um, so that's what that means. Long explanation, but... They didn't explain it in the book. Uh, situation, position of a place relative to others in the network. Um, well, there, they have some examples of these things. One being uh, Venice, Italy. Venice, Italy, right? When we talk about, well, why is that a great big city? Uh, why did that happen there? Because, well, the site itself isn't great. Like, it was swampy. It's like, well, why is there a big city built on a, on a marsh, you know? Well, it's because of its situation. It was central uh, as a trading hub. And also, you have to remember at the time, I was talking about how everything used to be transported with canals. Well, it's a city literally of canals, right? It's swampy and stuff, but it's like, well, that makes way so that every single road is a waterway. So you could actually transport things for the time and the technology that they had very inexpensively. There are bad things about it because there's it's prone to flooding and a number of the areas are actually sinking. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on that are kind of problematic with it today, but at the time it was the perfect mixture. Um, another example that the textbook uses talking about, well, a place that had a site that isn't so great, but its situation was, is uh, at the Atlanta airport. Atlanta, Georgia put in uh, when it was when uh, aviation started taking off and it was way more and more people traveled. They put in a very large complex uh, airport, right? And so people started flying through there as a big hub because uh, it was easier to get your connections and stuff. And now Atlanta, well, it's more of a hub than it would otherwise be. And this has actually made it's, it's helped their economy locally, right? More industries are going through there because it's easier to travel and send stuff in and out. Uh, some of the terms from this chapter, agglomeration effects. Agglomeration effects. <clears throat> Cost advantages created when similar businesses cluster in the same location. The example they use are fashion houses located in Paris. Right, because supporting industries, cloth, thread, 
Leather buttons, leather buttons, should that be two words? Ah, uh, not a lot of leather buttons out there. Fashion magazines, all things connected to that cluster of businesses locate there. Um, another example they talk about is tech companies located in Silicon Valley. Um, it's kind of interesting because although that is a great big, uh, well, agglomeration cluster, they don't really go into detail in the book about kind of why, they just kind of say it is. But of course, we should always be asking the question, why? Uh, do people want to know why Silicon Valley has so much high-tech stuff? Why there? Yeah. Uh, importing of like chips and stuff from Asia straight to California. Hmm. Not really. Uh, well, um, in California, in that area, it was relatively not super developed. And actually the defense industry started pouring money in there. And the defense industry wanted, uh, well, computers to be used, right? High tech stuff. And so they started a number of different, well, hiring out. And well, that, that was a steady, reliable basis of having a lot of high tech people live locally. Other companies that also wanted to be high tech well, if they located there, they could poach people from, from the different areas, right? So they're like, well, we have all these high-tech people working for the military. Let's talk to some of them and see if they would be willing to make a little bit more money making chips for us, right? Um, and you also have all the different inputs for these high-tech companies that start to grow in the same place. And so it's cheaper if you want to go into that business to locate at a place that has a lot of that other kind of business. It seems a little counterintuitive because you might think, wasn't there a lot of competition then for the same business? It's like, but you have a global market, so not really. Relationships in the global economy. Some more terms from this chapter, backward linkages, forward linkages, they're, they're what they sound like, right? If you have a, a company, relationships between a company and its suppliers, Right, you need your stuff to make your thing. And if the stuff stops coming in, you can't make your stuff anymore, very simple. Forward linkages, relationships between a company and its purchaser or distributors. You gotta also turn your product out, right? Everything is a flow, right? If things aren't flowing in and flowing out, you're not making your money. Gotta get one of those remote clicker things. Um, Actually, I'm going to talk about Silicon Valley a bit. Uh, some more terms from the book. Um, initial advantage, economic boost experienced by a region that is the hearth of a production of a good. Um, they talk about Silicon Valley, which we talked about a bit before. Um, they also talk about Flint, Michigan. It's kind of interesting because usually Detroit is the big example that's used. Uh, how is Detroit doing today economically? Not great, right? Now, Detroit, I mean, there's a reason that city's there. Uh, during the, the beginning of the automobile age, um, not only was Detroit a big center of automobile manufacturing, but local cities around them also started going to the same business because, again, they had the same connections, right? They could hire experts who were working in one, who were working for Ford, right? Well, what about, you know, General Motors? You come over and work for us, we'll pay you a little bit more so on and so forth. Um, bash, backwash effects. Negative economic impact in one region that stems from the positive economic impact in another region. So to stick on the example of Detroit, cheap cars from Japan. That was great for Japan. That spelled the end of Detroit. Not that Detroit doesn't still exist, but it's main industry, right? Um, its main industry went under. Uh, and the same, same with neighboring cities that also had that one industry, like Flint, Michigan. If you had that one industry and the one industry all of a sudden takes a dive, your whole economy to take a dive. That's one of the reasons why. Um, well, you know, manufacturing in the U.S. has been on the decline for quite a few years, right? Mostly because manufacturing in other countries around the world have become cheaper. 
Um, and that's caused a lot of economic problems in lots of places. Uh, but it tended to be places that had more of a diverse economic structure. Um, I use an example of Twin Cities as, an ex uh, as, as one example. Um, you know, we used to do more manufacturing. We used to have Ford plants and stuff, uh, like the Dayton's Bluffs area, which isn't doing great economically right now. That was where 3M used to have a lot of manufacturing. Well, in the whole US, when manufacturing went down, a lot of those places took an economic hit. The Twin Cities actually has a number of different clusters of companies. Um, so like medical products. We make a lot of medical products. Um, we actually have our own um, computer industry. These things are a bit smaller, but because it's more diversified, if any one thing kind of takes an economic hit, your whole local economy is not going to sink. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Uh, backwash effects. Spread effects, positive economic impact in one region that spurs positive economic growth in another region. Can you use that Detroit Flint example when they were the only place like in the world that was mass producing cars, they had a corner on the market, right? Detroit was the big happening place to be. Their economy soared. Other local cities, you know, they were like, let's just copy Detroit's model. Let's make cars, sell cars and they did great economically. Um, things, things don't always last. All right, end of this chapter talks a bit more about, um, well, talks all about climate, right? Talks about climate change. I would say that this uh, little part's pretty quick. Maybe the textbook assumes you've studied climate change in other classes probably have. I'm going to go through some of the ins and outs anyway. Uh, Anthropocene. Anthropocene. Uh, that's, uh, as you can see, it's a threshold concept in this chapter. Uh, the current geological era in which humans play a major role in shaping Earth's environment. Anthropocene. That's how you pronounce it. That's, you know, you have those big college words you used to impress your date. That's not one of them. No. They'll just leave, but like Anthropocene, what are you saying? Um, one of the interesting things about, well, the field of geography in this text, the Anthropocene, um, well, in guns, germs, and steel, right? I think most people were here for that, uh, that video. But that showed that inherent dynamic about, well, environmental determinism, right? Well, how much does the environment matter or not matter for how people live their lives? There are many who argue, they feel that Jared Diamond is way mu too much of an environmental determinist. That it's actually all up to people, because you could actually have all kinds of different developments in all kinds of different climates. And although that is true, it is all up to the people, there are some limitations that have to be acknowledged of, if you have a place that doesn't have resources, for example, well then you've got to figure out something else compared to a place that has a ton of resources. Right? Oh. All right. Uh, the text uses these pictures just to talk about how lots of places that have a kind of natural seeming quality to us are actually just completely human creations, um, changing the, our landscapes wherever we go, right? Planting trees where we want there to be trees, grass where we want there to be grass. Um, very few places that are unaffected by nature anymore, right? Um, or unaffected by humans changing nature. Um, so the Anthropocene talks about how basically, well, if we look at our climate and our air, well, then there isn't any place that is really untouched. Um, I also try to think of a lot about pollution, right? Because you have pollution that obviously, if you have a pluter that is right next to you, that is bad for you. Um, but pollution spreads around the earth. Um, so changes in uh, carbon dioxide greenhouse effect, greenhouse gases, um, warming trends in the atmosphere. Uh, you know, if, if you have uh, two flasks and, and one has a higher percentage of carbon dioxide and you throw the sun through it, one will warm up more, right? It's just chemically different. And yes, there's all kinds of different things going on in the climate. Um, so vulnerability. The susceptibility of a people in a place to negative phenomena. 
So this textbook looks at, well, you have a number of different places where not only is there environmental possibility of impacts that can happen from something like climate change or other negative environmental impacts, but also the individuals there might also be more vulnerable to those impacts, right? So for example, well, you know, I think we talked about tsunamis on the first day of class, right? It's like tsunamis. We're not gonna worry a lot about tsunami here in Minnesota, right? It's like, not, not a huge risk. Uh, if you're on an island, that the entire island is only one inch above sea level, you're worried about tsunamis, right? Um, so where you are geographically has more of an effect. <clears throat> um, so for example, this is a, another map from our book, and it was looking at places that have vulnerability to climate change, specifically uh, in this example, a lot of this risk has to do with sea level changes, right? And there are places that just don't have the infrastructure for sea level changes, be it in a temporary storm, right? When hurricanes come in, there's what's called a storm surge. Hurricane right, is swirling and it actually pulls the, the ocean up with it. And then when it hits land, right, there's a whole ground swell. It's kind of like a tsunami in a way because it will come on the land. Uh, and as you can see, well, you know, Katrina, uh, was a very bad hurricane and it messed up uh, a lot of areas. More recently though, had the examples in uh, New York. Did anyone see the videos of when the hurricane uh, waters hit New York and it was just like flooding everywhere? Well, they don't have the infrastructure for that, right? That is really far north for a hurricane. Uh, it's been predicted that with climate change, hurricanes are gonna hit further and further north because hurricanes are driven by warmth. You need the water to be a certain amount warm for you to have a hurricane. Uh, and usually northern areas are just too cold, but that is, that is not the case so much anymore. So double exposure, another term from this book. Double exposure just means you could have two phenomena in one place, right? So you could have a place that maybe is negatively affected by globalization, their economy is on the decline, because maybe the thing they make are being made elsewhere cheaper. Well, if you have that on top of, they have some climate risk, that's a double exposure in that area. Uh, the example I use uh, specifically is in India, um, talking about, well, there's places that will have more exposure to climate change because they're low elevation, right? So what storms hit, they'll cause more damage. Uh, sea rise, it happens through time because of climate change. Uh, but you also have places that also do not have the economy to kind of withstand uh, these impacts, right? Professor? Yeah? Have you ever been in a storm? Have I ever been in a storm? Yes. How was it? How was the storm? Do you mean like a hurricane? Like, did you feel scared for your life? Did you, did you think that you survived? Uh, you know, I very foolishly was not afraid for my life. The worst storm I could think of I've experienced. Uh, has anyone seen a tornado in real life? Yes, sir. Thanks to me. Yeah. There, I was not, I wasn't nervous. There was no real reason. I felt because I could have my eyes on it. I was like, it, okay, seems to be moving that way. So you're telling me you saw like 50 miles an hour of like literally little wind coming towards you and you were just like, all right, this is another like, this is well, you know, the winds where I was weren't fast. And I know enough about tornadoes. Um, I have a nephew who's a, a storm hunter. Uh, he should be more afraid than he is, but he's not. But why do you ask? No? Yeah. Uh, tornadoes also don't last long. So since I saw it in the distance and it was going to the side, I'm trying to remember where this was. I think this was, it might have been in St. Cloud. This is years ago though. Um, so don't get me wrong, if it would have come toward me, my attitude would have changed, you know? <laughs> it would have been like, well, maybe we should do those tornado drill things. Um, so do you think that's the reason that people, like, for example, two weeks ago there was a hurricane in um, Louisiana? Yeah. And a bunch of people just decided to stay instead of leaving. Do you think it's this type of attitude that kind of like, like I don't care if it comes or not. I mean, it's not going to affect me. Do you think it's that? 
there's definitely people who have that attitude, right? Um, but also, like, you've got to have resources to flee an area, right, if there's a hurricane coming. Uh, but I think that you're right. There are a lot of people who have the attitude of, like, this isn't going to hit me specifically. Um, what would you recommend? As far as encouraging people who are in the, the path of a hurricane? Uh -huh. I don't know, man. Wouldn't it just depend on the situation, how, like, aggressive it is or not? Yeah, that, that's her thing is you have plenty of people who have been through a hurricane and they may feel like they know how bad it's going to be. But hurricanes are, are tricky things, you know? You, what scared me personally was like, well, this hurricane, mm -hmm. I grew up in Katrina, was a big thing. Like, out of another generation, oh my God, like Katrina happened, uh, you know? And so, like, right after that, the U.S. Olympics won the Super Bowl, like, there was Katrina happening. Uh, but um, the point I'm trying to make is, so, like, this particular hurricane went from New Orleans all the way to New York City, like inland, like this one that happened the other day. Yeah. And so, like, should it be something that like we are afraid of as people living in Minnesota, like the map, the geographical location of like, the Midwest? Should we be afraid of hurricanes now? You know, it's a fair point. Um, I would say we did get some rain from it. Um, I would say. <coughs> We're far enough from a coast because once a hurricane hits land, it does start to because because the water is its energy source. And so once it hits land, it's still doing damage, but it's not getting energy anymore. Well, so you're tempting me to do my, I have a whole lecture on hurricanes that takes an hour, but I'm not gonna do it. But um, our lakes uh, don't work quite the way that oceans do, right? Our lakes, they don't heat up like that. There's not as much uh, evaporation. The power there, even on the hottest day, um, you'll get a tornado, but and a hurricane compared to a tornado, a hurricane is huge compared to a tornado, right? And we see tornadoes on the news and they make a lot of interesting videos and stuff. So people are like, oh, tornado. But hurricanes are so massive um, that again, once they do go inland, that water and everything can cause a lot of storms for plenty of places. Uh, Did you see that one video where like, the Florida man jumped into the tornado? What? The Florida man jumped into the tornado. Did you see that one video? I did not see that. Was it a movie? No, no, it was an interactive movie. All right. I did watch, what was that tornado movie? Uh, Dorothy, Dorothy. Oh, Wizard of Oz? Yeah. No, there was one on, I'm way getting off on attention. Um, what the heck was it about? Well, anyway, um, I did not see that video. Um, but I'm looking forward to looking it up, perhaps after class. Well. Can we watch that movie one day in class? <laughs> Man, if I had my druthers, there's all kinds of fun movies we'd watch, but it's only non-fun movies in this class, unfortunately. No fun to be had in the movies we'll be watching. I take that back. I'll show you guys a Bollywood movie later. No Bollywood way. movies are fun. Bollywood? I mean... All right, so at this point, this discussion's been fun, but we're going to switch gears because I do want you to work on some questions, but I'm going to do something differently today. I'm going to pick your groups for you. And it's going to be random chance to have cards with different colors on them. And um, I have sanitized my hands, so it should be safe. I hand these cards out, and then we're going to divide up by the color. So everyone just stay in place right now, come out with the cards, and then I'll organize you by the colors and clusters. Um, actually, let me get to... This is, if you guys remember the one you did last week where I said to write some things in here. You guys are right. Those are all the things you can have written in. Um, as I said, I'm going to hand out these cards. And you're going to let the fates decide who you work with today. All right. And obviously these cards are just for the colors, so you don't need to read them or do the things on them because it is a free deck I got from a friend once. If you send us that card, do we get extra credit for that? 
Wow, you're really angling. I will tell you what. Huh? All right. You get extra credit. No. But if you get a color that doesn't exist, I will take it into consideration. gets you working with, well, we're all a product of our environment a little bit, right? Any card. And where we sat in class, I forget, did you guys get a card? Uh, you know, we want to meet new people, bring us new perspectives, broaden our horizons. We could do this by being in unique groups, oh man. All right, who does that have a card? All right, and it's counted, I gotta get two more cards. Start with your side first, lap next time. All right. All right. Who has, for example, who has green? Who all has green? Green. Well, I would say there's a cluster over here. So green, move over to those people and form a group. Who has purple? Who has purple? Purple. Oh, there's kind of a cluster back there. Move over there, people who have purple. Who has, did I do blue already? Who has blue? Blue, come up here. There's a bit of a cluster here, blue. What colors we got left, pink? Who has pink? Pink, come on up here. We got a little bit of a cluster here. And then I think, how about this reddish orange color? Reddish orange. Reddish orange. How about you come over here? Because there's some empty seats. Reddish orange over here. And I'll come get your cards once you're in your groups. Can I get all your blue cards? 